Gentlemen, Sibloid, Lord of the Dark Vectors, and his Brilloid Sting ships are upon us. They are an elite force of Trivuglian dongloaders, firmly trained on this. Starwind from Nintendo. With its new FX ship, which allows near the perfect simulation of all types of deep space. What is it? Sir Richard! Oh. Portuguese cultural attache waiting in the drawing room. Oh, oh no! Oh no! Oh. Starwing, intrepid and intergalactic Nintendo. Hey all, this is Sean from the Pompey Games Room. First of all, I want to start off by thanking you for checking out my first video of 2012, which is a review of a game I've wanted to cover ever since I started this channel. Today we're going to be taking a look at one of my favourite childhood games in Starwing. I'm going to try and go over everything for this game, from information, to production, cancelled versions, and also some gameplay. So, let's start at the beginning. The year is 1993 and legendary creator Shigeru Miyamoto, creator of the Mario series of games, and Takeya Imamura have been working on a revolutionary new game with amazing graphics. Breaking away from Mario titles, which the Nintendo always invested huge amounts of money in, Star Fox, or Starwing, created a new and welcome type of game which would heavily influence everything that came after it. Starwing was inspired by a shrine to a fox god who could fly. Miyamoto visited this regularly during his childhood and during stages of the development of this game. The shrine was accessible through a series of arches thus inspiring the gameplay, with the player needed to guide their ship through the arches in early levels of the game. Both Miyamoto and Takeya wanted to take advantage of a revolutionary graphics accelerator ship which was designed by a company called Argonaut Games, who worked closely with Nintendo during the early years of the NES and the SNES. Argonaut developed a prototype game using an early version of the chip, codenamed NES Glider. This game was heavily influenced by Argonaut's 1986 release of a game called Star Glider. With Nintendo impressed, Argonaut got to work on a new chip which had the ability to create a 3D gaming experience along with greater rendered graphics. Other Nintendo games that would go on to take advantage of this chip were Dirt Racer, Dirt Tracks FX, Stunt Race FX and Vortex. This chip would start off its life being known as the Mario chip, which stood for Mathematical Argonaut Rotation, with an I and O added to the end spelling the iconic Nintendo mascot's name. It would later go on to be renamed the Super FX chip in time for the Japanese release of Starwing in February 1993. It would later go on to be released in North America in March and in Europe for June 1993. The search is over. The Super FX heralds the future of gameplay. Game cartridges that contain a Super FX chip have additional contacts along the bottom that connect into the extra slots which are not normally used by standard SNES cartridges. Cartridge adapters such as cheat devices made before the release of the Super FX chip such as the Game Genie did not have a connection for these previously unused slots. This meant that Super FX games could not be plugged into these devices. Work on Star Fox originally started in mid-1991. By late 1992, the game's main design was completed, along with character design and also a full soundtrack for the game. Miyamoto was adamant from the outset that he wanted to make a different sort of space shooter game away from the typical science fiction stories with robots, monsters and superheroes. So the idea of using animals as main characters in this game franchise were implemented into the main character designs. Animals that were implemented into Star Fox were a pheasant, hare, dog, monkey, toad and of course a fox, which was the main character in the original game, Fox McCloud. 
Straight from the outset, in 1993, this sort of graphics for the Nintendo logo would have been totally unseen on Super Nintendo titles before. I remember that this intro sequence blew my mind when I first saw it as a 9 year old. It was like nothing I would ever seen before, and considering I've been playing games like Super Monaco GP, FIFA and Sonic titles at the time, this game was just something completely different. Also pair that up with an awesome soundtrack and sound effects. You can understand why many people consider this game to be a real milestone in the transition to the new gaming era which would see consoles such as the Nintendo 64, Sega Saturn and PlayStation take the lead. So now we've gone over some development facts on this game, let's finally start to play some Starwin. So we now find ourselves at the main title screen and by pressing start you'll go into a demo mode that will outline to you how to perform moves such as barrel rolls, speed boosts and also how to use special weapons and power-ups which you'll pick up throughout levels. This screen I always found it pretty handy as from playing the Mega Drive more than playing a SNES growing up trying to get used to the extra shoulder buttons which were included on the SNES pad and the extra button always came in handy before starting the game proper. So for the purposes of this review today we're going to start off by playing the route along the bottom which is the easy route. At this screen you could choose between difficulty settings with the bottom route being the easiest, middle being about even and the top route being the more difficult of the three game modes. All three paths contain the planet Corneria, which is the first stage of the game, and the planet Venom, which is the last level. Once you've selected your path, you will go to your mission objective screen, which will point out all the objectives that you need to obtain in order to complete the level. So once this little cutscene plays, you'll start the first level of the game. Scores at the end of each level are based on how many enemies are destroyed, how fast you can save your team when being pursued by enemies, and how many difficult manoeuvres and power-ups you can pick up along the way. While speaking about helping out your teammates, it's worth mentioning that if you decide not to help them and they get shot down, they will be unavailable to you for the rest of the game. Damage on Starwing is shown to the bottom left hand corner of the screen. This shield bar will decrease throughout gameplay as to how much damage you have taken. A cool thing to this game is that you can take a fair amount of damage to each level. Also if one of your ship's wings clips against the buildings or other obstacles during levels in this game, they will break off adversely affecting your craft's handling and the ability to upgrade weapons. Damn it, damn it, damn it. 
This game is so much more than just a rail shooter set in the third person perspective. The second stage to this game is set in an asteroid field, where you must dodge and navigate your way through all the asteroids to progress from the first person perspective. You will also find a secret stage in this level, which can be entered by flying towards two slow moving meteors. By shooting the one on the right and destroying it, a small egg will appear, which will then explode in the middle of the screen. By using your turbo boost, you will be taken to a special stage where you will play as a fruit machine for all sorts of in-game goodies. There are so many brilliant stages to this game. One of the later levels in particular was pretty mind blowing back in the day. Whilst flying through a large battleship, you must guide your craft up, over and around obstacles that stand in your way. So this was just one of the many areas to this game that further enhanced its reputation as a real step forward in game design in 1993. The follow-up to this smash hit was announced in 1994 by Nintendo. Star Fox 2 was scheduled to be released on the SNES in 1995, with the Japanese version of this game completely finished. With exception to some minor bugs and glitches, Nintendo decided to hold back the sequel for the up-and-coming console, Nintendo 64. An enhanced version of Star Fox 2 would go on to be renamed Star Fox 64 in Japan and in North America, and Light Out Wars in Europe upon release. Star Fox 2 on the SNES was even extensively covered by various game magazines in late 94 and early 95, with many screenshots provided by Nintendo to generate interest in the sequel. This really does show how far down the line Nintendo were with the sequel. It's a real shame that it never saw the light of day on the SNES. Although Lalat Wars and Star Fox 64 went on to be amazing games, on the N64, a SNES version would have been warmly welcomed by all Nintendo owners back in the day. So this pretty much brings me to the end of the review now. I really hope you've enjoyed the look back at this awesome game. It can be picked up on eBay for around about £4 delivered unboxed, so there really is no reason not to have this game in your collection. Please feel free to comment, rate and subscribe, and until next time, thanks for watching.